Hello everyone, it is good to be with you. Discussions about e-learning have proliferated in response to how African universities and colleges experimented with online and remote learning during the COVID-19 lockdowns. The results are mixed and vary quite widely. The experimentation has also raised deeper issues about the implementation of technology in university settings, ranging from basic tools such as learning management systems, including the familiar Moodle, to ed tech apps and research technology. In some cases, universities have moved online with little for support for faculty or major consideration for how students would access synchronous and asynchronous material. Welcome to Leaders of Africa Live. Leaders of Africa Live is interactive. Share your voice and join in the conversation in the chat. Call in using the Zoom link at leadersofafrica.org slash live, found below, or tweet using the hashtag, hashtag Leaders Africa Live. Let us know where you're joining us from. Select comments and call-ins will be shared and discussed in today's live broadcast. And that is right, we are live today. It is good to be with you. Before we get into our conversation, we want to set the stage for our discussion of higher education and technology. COVID-19 greatly disrupted normal educational delivery for over 297 million learners, and the number increases as plans for the future instruction are released. Some universities attempted to shift their efforts to online instructions, but there are major concerns about the equity stemming from several existing challenges, beginning with reliable electricity, access to technology assets, connectivity to the internet, and additional costs of accessing online material. One can see that the electricity grid penetration varies very widely across countries, and of course the existence of the grid does not guarantee a reliable supply of electricity. In many ways, the present discourse reflects an approach where already cash-strapped students and their families must fend for themselves to foot the bill. Similar concerns are present on the faculty side, including inadequacy, inadequacy of in-house training using online platforms and many questions surrounding evidence-based pedagogical approaches. It is time to debrief and discuss these major challenges and make some clear decisions and have clear direction before we begin to move forward. And that's what sets the stage for today's conversation, which I'm really glad uh, we are having. Um, today, we are joined by two great guests. Uh, we are joined by uh, Professor Rose Moana, who is joining us from Egerton University. She is the Vice Chancellor of Egerton University and is joining us right now from Calling from Kenya. Welcome, Rose, to you. And we Thank are also, you. It's good to have you here. And we are also joined by Professor Jalili Adibi from Michigan State University. Welcome to you. He is joining us from Michigan in the United States. How are you doing? Thank you, Peter, for hosting us today. And you'll notice that we've had a slight uh, change in the panel today, and that was due to some connection issues with uh, uh, Professor uh, Idibdapo uh, Obe. Um, so we've had to change things up a bit, and hopefully we'll be able to include him if he's able to connect during our conversation today. So I want to start with you, Rose. Um, you've been the vice chancellor of, um, of Egerton University for a, a number of years, and I'm I want to know a little bit about what Egerton looked like in at the beginning of your time and beginning of your tenure in 2016 in terms of the technological resources that you had at that time um, and how they sort of changed um, in the last couple of years that you've been vice chancellor of the university. Well, thank you, Peter. Um, Egerton University is a very old university a very old institution. It started in 1939 as a, a farm school. And uh, it moved on up to date. Um, for a long time, we have just been using computers to help us uh, write our notes and also use it for email and uh, even PowerPoint. Uh, in the university, we have a college of uh, e-learning. 
uh, we had not developed it uh, very much the way we would like to. And uh, that is because um, what we have been doing, we kind of like to face to face. Uh, the face-to-face -face, uh, interaction has been the norm. So uh, we have not been very actively involved in the e-learning. Mm -hmm. But since the COVID-19 came up, we have just started using the e-learning and we have a number of our staff, faculty, that are now uh, being trained on how to um, develop the courses so that they can be uploaded in our e-learning uh, platform. Mm -hmm. That's where we are now. So you'll find a number of uh, faculty now working very hard to make sure that they develop the courses which are now going to be uploaded in our system. And what is that e-learning platform? I hope you are really? hearing me. Yes, I, do, I am. And, and what does that e-learning platform look like? What are some of the technological resources that are embedded in that e-learning platform? Well, we are using the computer. We are using our online systems like the Kenet. Kenet is in a, a Kenya uh, educational um, network which we use around here and is the one we are using. Then we use uh, Zoom. We use uh, Zoom a lot here because it is the one that Kenneth is using. Occasionally when we talk to international world, uh, we use the webinar, which is not very common around, with us here at Edgerton. And, um, and how many of the co students are able to access some of these resources that uh, you have on the online platform? How, how, what, is, what does access look like? That's where the problem is. The access is not as high as we would love it to be. And uh, the main reason is when we are on campus, there is no problem. Mm -hmm. Students who are outside the campus, affordability becomes a problem. Mm -hmm. Many of them are not able to afford uh, getting all the facilities the way we would like them to, to, to do it. Uh, the other problem which is very common is the network. The network has not reached the whole country. Mm -hmm. And even if it can reach, Still, affordability is a problem to many students who are coming from the rural areas. Mm -hmm. Our right. Edgerton students are mainly agricultural oriented. They learn a lot of agricultural and practical oriented courses. And that becomes a, a problem. How we can uh, do that online? is also a problem which we need to think about. So in some of the rural areas are very remote and uh, electricity has not reached there. And some of those students cannot really do the online training the way we would like it to be done. Mm -hmm. It is a challenge. And so what are some of the things that uh, you're doing or you're thinking about uh, in Kenya in terms of um, improving some of these in infrastructural uh, constraints that are present that you've mentioned? Are there any approaches that are being taken? And also, I'm curious what the relationship is from the university to, um, say, other stakeholders, such as the government that may be able to provide some of that infrastructure or support. What does that look like? Well, we have a ministry that deals with ICT. They have also come to Edgerton to train our students. 
But as I said, uh, we were comfortable with the face-to-face. -face. It is now that we are going to pursue it uh, rigorously so that we can work with the, uh, with the Ministry of uh, uh, Communication and ICT um, so that they can think about us as a university. Especially Edgerton is uh, in the rural area. We are not very close to the city. But um, we have done a lot to make sure that um, uh, we, 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 we keep up with the time the way it should be. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, 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 we are trying our best. Absolutely, absolutely. And so what, what are the, some of the majors at Egerton University? What, what are some of the um, background of the students that are, that are there? I don't know background in which sense. Most of them have gone to school and done um, the sciences. You know, we are, uh, um, agriculture is an applied science. And uh, before you do it, you have to do basic sciences, which most of our students have done. And uh, computer science is a must. They have to do courses on computer sciences. And we are, um, we are pushing the students to get into IT. And our students uh, normally, uh, they are doing very well. I want to say that. Despite the fact that we are agricultural oriented. Mm -hmm. We have the Department of Computer Science where they are also doing uh, IT and, and uh, ICT. All those are part of it, yes. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. So I'm curious um, whether universities in Kenya work together to solve some of these issues. What is the conversations that take place between, say, Egerton University and other universities like uh, University of Nairobi or, um, for example, USIU and in, in also outside of, just outside of Nairobi? Is there a lot of collaboration that takes place uh, between these different universities? Yeah, we have collaborations taking place, but um, as I told you earlier, we had not been very forthright in the ICT. It is now that uh, um, we are beginning to talk about um, uh, the ICT and how we can teach online and all that. And you find a number of our universities have picked themselves up and uh, they are working online in a number of uh, areas. Uh, we The other day when the vice chancellors were discussing this online, we realized that uh, it's difficult to do exams online mm -hmm. because of, uh, of the security. These are things that are hindering us from really moving ahead. We have Absolutely. to find a way of, uh, you know, mitigating against the, 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 the security issues that are likely to uh, hamper our examinations. So yeah. we are talking about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, building on what, what yes. Rose said, uh, Jalili, what do you think of this issue of exam security? We've heard that from a number of professors, um, where a lot of courses, as you know, are exam-based. Um, and, uh, and obviously that varies across different universities, but it's, exams are still play that very important role. And, and there's always been this question about exam security when, we, when teaching is done in person, right? A number of countries have had some concerns around exam answers being leaked or, or, or things of this nature, people sitting in for exams. So this concern was sort of present before. Ghana, what, what does this look like in the context of Nigeria? And, and are there potential solutions for thinking about uh, exam and, and assessments more broadly uh, in this more remote environment? Well, thank you so much, uh, Peter. And uh, uh, the thing about exam in the context of African University and uh, as it relates to Nigeria uh, is that uh, it constitutes, uh, exams constitute uh, a huge percentage of uh, student assessment. 
uh, when I was a student at the University of Lagos back in the days, uh, exams used to be like 70% of the overall grade. And uh, that means that uh, uh, if you miss the exam, chances are that you're never going to pass a particular course. I want to assume that is the situation in Kenya and in some other university. And uh, I've come across, uh, you know, thousands of uh, students from Africa here in the United States and in different conferences uh, all spoke about this concept of exam, the quality almighty exam, you know. And that is not necessarily the situation in the United States, uh, whereby exam constitute less than 10 percent, sometimes 20 percent of the overall grading of the overall grades of students in a particular course. Uh, so there has always been that, you know, tension that surrounds uh, the issue of exams, the issue of anxiety on the part of the student and on the part of the faculty member. Uh, however, uh, there are ways uh, that uh, this issue can actually be handled when you look at it from the perspective of uh, education technology. And in fact, one of the things that education technology can actually make a uh, uh, do for us in African educational, higher educational context uh, is to make it possible for us to conduct uh, each, uh, exams without having to worry about issues of leakages per se, as it would be in the case of our traditional setting. Uh, because there are ways that uh, we can set up exams and uh, conduct exam leveraging educational technology and uh, preventing issues of uh, leakages uh, that possibly would have taken place uh, without leveraging those technologies. Uh, I could remember when I was at the University of Lagos, prior to the time I got to the University of Lagos, there was a fire chancellor called Professor Jelimi of Motola. Uh, he invested, uh, there was a, uh, he built a facility that could contain about 10 to 15,000 students at a go. Uh, they used this facility for that event, they let it out for people to do wedding in this facility, and that's the generation come from the university. Uh, the other purpose of this facility was to have that huge facility that students can be seated, they can come in, they can take the exams, and uh, there, are, there were meant to be some uh, technological equipment, you know, installed in that particular hall that will assist in supervising and minimizing cases of shooting by students. That was one way uh, that uh, the University of Lagos uh, sought to conduct exams. Uh, by leveraging technology. I don't know uh, what is happening, what has happened over the years to this particular arrangement. And this particular arrangement is very similar to what they do with the GRE exams, with what they do with some of the standardized exam, TOEFL exams, because when you want to write a TOEFL exam, everything is conducted electronically. You can do the paper TOEFL exam, you can do the paper GRE exam, but for the more, in most cases, exams that standardized exam happen electronically and the issues of leakages and uh, you know cheating are reduced to the barest minimum. So what this tells me is that we can learn from these kinds of examples, cases, uh, to draw examples, you know, insight from what we can do differently in order to address some of the tension associated with conducting exams electronically in Africa. I want to de disagree a little bit uh, with the features. I want to lessen the anxiety uh, uh, regarding uh, use leveraging the technology to conduct exam. If at all, technology will assist us to do better, uh, you know, managing the issue of uh, examination leakages and uh, malpractices. All we just need to do is to tidy up the technology and make sure that uh, the technology is uh, glitch free. Uh, uh, because of the technology, like we discussed uh, in a program yesterday at the Leaders of Africa, uh, one of the things we made uh, reference to uh, is the use of technology to conduct exam. You can conduct exam by leveraging uh, learning management systems. You can use module to administer exams. And uh, there are many features, functionality in this technology that makes it possible for exams to be easily conducted. You know? So I, I, I believe that the uh, uh, University of Lagos has been making some very reasonable effort in this situation. Likewise, some other investors in Nigeria, and uh, but we can do generally better uh, by collaborating to see what is exchanging notes, to know what is working well with them in Kenya, know what is working well better at them at the university, what is working well with them at the University of Lagos, and what is working with other counterpart university. You know, this collaborative environment is required uh, for us to build that capacity to leverage technology 
in getting exam better conducted in different African universities. So, Rose, I want to build off of that point that uh, Professor Jalili mentioned about the use of learning management systems. So, at Egerton University, um, is do you guys do you generally in, ensure that professors use some sort of learning management system such as Moodle or Sakai or Blackboard? These out there, have you been able to leverage some of those platforms for um, you know receiving assessments from students like papers or other assessments or attempting to at least uh, run exams? I'm curious uh, what that looks like. No, no, no. Um... We, we are still very um, low in that area mm -hmm. because uh, as I told you earlier, our, our examination system has been face-to-face. Uh, uh, -face. This is the first time uh, we are uh, thinking about that, that uh, we should now do exams online. We have a few courses here that have been uh, sponsored by um, other, other um, organizations. Those ones, um, we, we kind of uh, try to do the exam online, mm -hmm. but uh, we are not well developed yet in the examination setting. Mm -hmm. And so I can't talk much about it on that line. So, and I'm curious, Rose, if examinations become difficult to ensure that they're secure, have, have professors found other ways of assessing students um, or that are promising in terms of in assessing students' competencies on various things outside of, say, uh, an exam-based approach? Well, the normal examination where you deal with a student face-to-face, -face, there is no problem because you are invigilating. Mm. But the problem with online uh, examination, you don't know who is next to the student. Mm -hmm. So you don't know whether somebody is whispering something to them or showing them what to do. That's where the problem is. And I think it is an area we really need to uh, work on uh, very closely to monitor how we can make it better. Mm -hmm. And Ghana, uh, Jalili, Professor Jalili, what, are there ways of making that exam better? Because you mentioned some other different approaches to assessing students, but it seems like exams are still uh, very important. You mentioned that concept of the almighty exam. Um, are there approaches of delivering exams of, of doing this in a perhaps a, a more secure way or, or something like an exam? Well, thank you so much, uh, Peter, for this uh, brilliant question. Uh, there are two things about this. Uh, one thing is to uh, probe the question. Do we need to change our construction of exams and how students are assessed? Uh, because one of the uh, challenges with COVID-19 is that uh, it sort of disrupted the concept of uh, assessment. And uh, professors and faculty members, university administrators, uh, they've been rising up to the occasion by going back to the world, by asking the question, what do we seek to achieve by examining a student? Uh, is it the purpose, is the purpose of exam just to give students an exam to write? Or is it that we are just trying to test a student's competency? You know, maybe if actually we are trying to mirror their learning outcomes to know maybe they understood those concepts and that uh, they deserve to be given a pass mark that we have actually passed or failed a particular result. And that leads me to some of the concepts that faculty members in the uh, United States uh, they, they, they've embraced during this era of COVID-19. What people did was to go back to the drawing board and uh, they gave students two options. You can either sit for an exam and be graded traditionally as we used to do before the era of COVID-19. Or you write an exam and you receive a pass or fail grade. Mm -hmm. I don't think this conversation has necessarily taken place in Africa. Uh, what our faculty members and colleagues in Africa possibly need to look into is the question of how do we treat students in this very unusual situation? 
do we need to go by the traditional construction of grading of which requires students to write almighty exams? And uh, the situation does not allow us to actually do that now because uh, universities are closed. Students, they will have to write their exams from homes. And even when you look at this exam that students need to write electronically, students are still faced with many challenges. One, some students might not have access to electricity as of the time that they are going to write exam online. The other thing is this, students might have internet problems. They might start writing the exam, and for them to upload their responses, this might also be another challenge with them. You know, this is another problem. Then the other problem is that uh, student, the environment may not even be conducive for students to take their exams. Uh, because we don't know the places where these students are living, you know, we don't know maybe, you know, because we need to take into account their socioeconomic background. And what that means is that uh, some students might actually do well in their exams. Some students might not actually do well in their exams, not because they've not really prepared very well for the exam, but because of the certain environment surrounding them that will constrain them from performing excellently in their exams. So all of these things taken into account within the context of African students and African educational institutional challenges requires us to think through this construction of exam. Do we need to do our exams the way we used to do them before COVID-19 when all of our students will come you know, to the classroom and uh, will conduct an exam at a particular point and uh, we have to provide us, you know, you know supervise the process, even the one that we do in traditional settings, there are issues of cheating, you know, because uh, there is, imagine you're conducting an exam for about 100 students and there are no technological facilities to yeah. actually monitor who's doing what and doing what. The best you can do is that uh, it's something that is within the, the purview of your site. Whatever is not within the purview of your site, you can't actually know what is happening within that context. And, you know, your eyes can't be all over the place at the same time. So, many the issue of shooting, you know, the issue of examination or practices uh, might still be an issue in the traditional setting. And uh, with the use of technology, I do believe that African universities will be in better positioned to, con to, to conduct examination exams that we uh, have a need to to know instances of cheating and examination of practices. Obviously, we can't eliminate examination of practices completely, but we always want to strive to improve the integrity of examination processes. And I do think uh, technology has a role to play in this. And the other thing is that uh, we might need to move away from this construction of almighty exam because it's not healthy for faculty member, neither is it healthy for a student. You know, maybe if we've been doing this gradual approach of, uh, you know, like a uh, gradual assessment of our student at uh, different interfaces of delivering our classes, I don't think we possibly might not be having these huge challenges that we are facing uh, uh, with the outbreak of COVID-19 in many of our universities. Because the problem is the bulk of the assessment is coming through this exam. 70% and that means the students have to be loaded with some questions and they have, we have to give them feedback. And, uh, mm -hmm. and if we have softened the process in a way that what is left of the building process is just 20% to the exam, we possibly might have you know, been able to devise some alternative ways of getting the same thing done, possibly giving them an assignment and then the writing. Because at the end of the day, when the students graduate from the university and they get to the job market, their performance in the job market will not be based on exams, like, oh, they give them an exam, because in that situation, whatever decision they want to make, they can open their books, you know, they can do sort of things. So we can be creative about this concept of exam. We can say, okay, we are giving you open book exams. Mm -hmm. And that comes back to, like, we are trying to look at alternative ways of creatively addressing the problem. We could also give them the options of pass or fail. That means you are not going to be graded at the end of the day based on maybe you scored a distinction, maybe or maybe you scored a B plus or a B minus, but because you've demonstrated certain competencies indicating that you've understand the concept and all the issues so taught in a particular course. You know, that is going back to us redefining the construction of the exam. 
uh, this is a long-term conversation that uh, faculty members absolutely. and African University yeah, uh, chancellors need to have. I, I, I like that discussion of, of maybe this is an opportunity. It sounds like, uh, Professor uh, Adibi, that this is an opportunity perhaps to think past or beyond exams in, in your view. And I, but I want to come back, we'll, we'll come to that question, but I want to come back to something that you said that was really intriguing was this, um, this matter of, of access to an exam. Even if you're able to do an exam, you suggested that some students may not be able to access the, that exam themselves at the given time and place that they would need to due to other sort of challenges that are there. Thinking broadly about this sort of issue of connectivity, data, and electricity, how much are these fundamental problems with some of the universities that you work with in Nigeria? And, and, and what does that picture look like? Um, are there some students that are able to connect very easily to some of these platforms? Are there those that face challenges? Um, how, what, what, what is going on in, in, in terms of this connectivity at the given time and place that one would need to, to access an exam or access material more broadly? Peter, the problem is pervasive. And that is why universities in Africa, they are taking a cautionary, a precautionary approach to what they can do and what they cannot do uh, with the outbreak of COVID-19 regarding uh, administering exams on their students. Let me cite some uh, very personal experiences with it. When I was doing my doctoral dissertation in Nigeria, you know, I conducted my studies on organic farmers in Ibadan. So I, I spent a lot of time at the University of Ibadan. I enjoyed tremendous support from many of the professors over there. And I worked with them. Uh, many times uh, they gave me an office space for which I was working. You won't believe it. They had internet connectivity problem. Some of the professors, they have to use their money to buy a reliable internet. And uh, many times when I connect to the university internet, I guess easily, you know, it was it was so difficult to even download an article. The problem was so enormous that the only alternative way you could solve this problem as a faculty member or as a researcher was to get money out of your pocket and buy a reliable internet. And many faculties could, couldn't even do this because what is their take-home pay at the end of the month? They have bills. They have the educational bills of their kids. They have their personal key bills. They have to pay for their house uh, rent and et cetera, et cetera. That is at the level of faculty members struggling to connect with the internet, to download articles, or even to connect with conferences online or to hold meetings online. It was so difficult communicating with people online using the university internet. Mm -hmm. That is at the level of the university. When you come down to the level of the student, the problem varies depending on the social economy background of the student. Uh, many of these students, you know, you have to take into account that poverty in Nigeria is the poverty capital of the world. And a good number of the students in Nigerian University, they are from poor homes. Uh, many of them, you know, they have to fend for themselves and, be, and they are responsible as well for their educational expenses. A part of these educational expenses is paying their school fees, you know, feeding themselves, buying books, and keeping on top of their educational activities. And many, so if I impose the additional cost of transiting online, transitioning online, then it means that they have to have reliable internet access. Mm -hmm. When you look at the need for reliable internet access and the poverty condition, of these uh, many students in Nigeria University. The implication is that when we transition online, do a lot of things online, uh, we'll be creating a dis differentiated situation whereby some students will be more disposed to do better, not because they are better than the other ones, but because of their financial situation. They are able to buy good internet and uh, they are able to assess their courses listen to lectures online and get his own. But those who are struggling, who do, who do not have the financial capacity to buy good internet, or, you know, to buy good internet, then you are going to have some challenges, you know, assessing lectures and getting this done. So we'll be creating this inequality 
that will further widen the uh, you know the gaps in the, in the socioeconomic and here the quality gaps in the society. And universities are meant to eliminate this constraint. Universities are meant to be levelers. They are meant to create you know an enabling environment for all kinds of students, regardless of their socioeconomic background. But so Rose, when we act in the country, so, so Rose, I, I wanted to pick up uh, uh, prof on Professor Jalili's uh, uh, point here about the potential inequities uh, that may be present, where some students may um, be able to access online resources, um, assuming that sort of there is this um, uh, wealth of on online resources that is present or synchronous teaching, and then some students sort of find it very difficult. Are you also uh, uh, kind of concerned about that uh, inequities, that situation of inequities that may occur um, if a lot of resources are uh, obtained, uh, instruction is obtained through online means or using some sort of form of connectivity? Yes, Peter, it is, uh, I tell you, I think it would be even worse because majority of our students come from very poor backgrounds and uh, they may not be able to access some of the, um, even the internet, sometimes even the, the, the electricity. They don't have electricity sometimes in their homes. So it would be very difficult the time you, as a lecturer, when I'm talking about, uh, let's start at this time and electricity is not there, it's a bit difficult. I think we have a, a still a long way to go. And uh, I told you earlier, even reaching the, the internet is not an easy thing for many of our students. So um, it's a bit uh, tricky at this particular time. Although we are trying, I don't want to say that it is an easy move. We have to work harder be able to uh, really get where we are expected to. Mm -hmm. And uh, even in the country, well, the ICT has not reached everywhere. It is within the cities, it is within Edgerton, all right, but not even the whole part of it. So we, we have a lot of work to do. We mm -hmm. still have a lot of work to do, Peter. It's not as easy as it sounds. But we are trying our best. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I and yes. I, I, you, you mentioned at the beginning of our discussion how Egerton University has a big sort of emphasis on the study of agriculture uh, and has a history in agriculture. Um, and I'm curious because there's overlap uh, because Jalili is also a professor that deals with issues of agriculture. And I'm, I'm, I'm curious some of the specific concerns to the study of agriculture in this online environment and, and how that takes shape. So uh, Jalili, do you want to reflect on what the vice chancellor has just you know, said earlier in the interview? She was talking about the importance of, of studying agriculture and, and, the, and the nexus of that with this online platform. So are there unique challenges to studying agricultural elements, the food supply chain, um, food security <laughs> issues in this respect? I mean, yeah, that was a very good question. Uh, I was so happy that uh, uh, Fight Chancellor brought up this issue uh, because agriculture is uh, not only central to the economy in Africa, uh, it's also a major part of uh, our institutional education in Africa. Uh, because uh, if you really want to advance the agriculture in a particular country, then uh, it has to have a place, a very focal place uh, in uh, our institutional educational programs uh, in universities in Africa. Uh, well, that said, there are things we can do by teaching classes online, by teaching some uh, things about agriculture online. Uh, but agriculture is not just all we teach our students online. Uh, or what we teach them through traditional classes. There's a practical component of agriculture as well. Uh, you know, we can teach them the fundamental science behind crop production. We can teach them the fundamental science beyond like, grassland management. We can teach them all of those. And uh, we can also consider, uh, conduct some demonstrations you know, online by sharing videos with a student how things get done, how they can manage certain diseases, how they can till their land, you know, 
there are videos that we can leverage either you see the synchronous or the asynchronous uh, means of uh, delivering lecture online. We can do a lot of things online. And there are agricultural programs that are being delivered online, you know, master's degree program, undergraduate degree program that are being conducted by some university. To set the other side is the practical aspect of it, you know, getting the student to the field to learn the practical aspect of agriculture. And that is not the case with most agricultural programs. There are certain programs in agriculture that you might not even go to the field. But in most cases, our cultural programs require that our student get to the field. So we can teach certain components of the classes online, and then the component that requires our student to go to the field, we can also make provisions for that. So it's very possible. And uh, one of the beauty of leveraging technology uh, is that it actually prepares students. It gives them the capacity to leverage technology outside of their educational environment. You know, when students are trained using the technology, they develop some capability that will be useful for them uh, in whatever they want to do. They become technologically literate and uh, they, became, they become insightful about what they can do with certain technological applications. You know, all of these things are going to improve their employability. And uh, that is why it is important that we integrate technology into the delivery of our educational activities, uh, either in agriculture or outside of agriculture. So in response to your question, Pira, uh, my comment, my response is that uh, uh, it is good for us to integrate uh, technology into the delivery of agricultural related classes. It is easy. Uh, and there are many ways we can define technology using education. Technology might mean that we are applying technology for managing our class delivery. That's what we call learning management systems. They are using it in some South African university. In Ghana, they use what they call Sakai. You know, in some other universities like Africa Factual University, they are using what we call the model. You know, and that is what we are also using at the leaders of Africa. Here in the US, you know, uh, through my graduate education, I was exposed to different things. I was exposed to what they call the B2L. I was exposed to what they call Canvas. I was exposed to what they call Blackboard. These are all technological applications that can be used to inform the belief of education in Africa. And the good thing about these platforms is that they improve the learning experiences of our students. And they also improve the effectiveness of the delivery of courses by faculty members. Uh, particularly when you have to teach each classes, 600 students in a class. It's this learning management system, you know, it takes away a lot of stress, it takes away a lot of hassles, and it improves the delivery, of, it creates a play level brand. For example, through the learning management system, you can upload the course materials that your students are meant to read for a particular class session. And what that means is that students you don't have to go to the comfort copy center where they are selling their course materials, they can easily access this material online. They don't have to print, that is more sustainable. They can just download the course materials on their devices, either their phones or their laptop, and they can read and prepare for their classes. Even somebody who doesn't have the financial resources to buy a textbook, through that, he or she will have access to the material. And that means that we are even bringing some constraint that otherwise might have affected negatively the you know the the, the participation you know the, the the deep engagement of our students in the in, in our classes and our educational delivery processes. I, I want you know, so that is one way. Jalili, I want to build yeah. on, on one of the things that you say and, and pose this question to the, the vice chancellor, which is you, you've suggested using a lot of these learning management platforms. You mentioned Sakai, you mentioned Moodle. These are free and open source platforms um, that can be used for, you know, providing resources to students, interacting with students and uploading assignments, things of this nature. But it obviously takes a faculty that is able and trained to use some of those learning management systems because they have their intricacies here and there um, using things like Moodle. Um, in my past experience using Moodle and, and uh, D2L, which is desire to learn. Um, to you, Vice Chancellor, how well are faculty members, not just at Edgerton University, but more but in general in Kenya, 
um, sensitized and trained in using some of these platforms? Or is there a gap in terms of, of very different uh, abilities and training in this area of using some of these online platforms? What, what does that look like, Vice Chancellor? Uh, well, thank you, Peter. Uh, I, I think it is still, uh, um, as I said earlier, uh, quite a number of our our faculties are just being trained on some of these things. There are some that are well ahead, but majority are still training on how to use some of these uh, uh, platforms. So I don't think it is only uh, at Edgerton, but uh, it is in many other universities. But those who, who have been trained on it, they do it very well. They are very good at it, and uh, it's not a problem. But for many of our faculties, we are still training them. Uh, that makes sense. And, and just building off of that, <laughs> Vice Chancellor, where should that training come from in your mind? Do you view that, uh, do you think that the universities themselves should be engaging in more of this training internally? Or do you think it's really important to engage external partners to help in some of those training exer exercises? What, what would you ideally like to see uh, at Edgerton University, but also uh, amongst professors, broadly speaking, in Kenya? Well, uh, as we have done with other, uh, other disciplines, we can have collaborative uh, training, which we have, we have done with other, other disciplines or, or, or other courses. But also in the country, we normally say we need to set uh, a certain amount of uh, uh, budget for some of these things. Uh, well, I think we need to start taking it more seriously and set a budget for some of these technologies that would help the universities move forward. Without a budget, it is impossible to just say, I'm training. You train with what? You must have a budget that will help you train so many at a time, and then you can say it is okay. Without that, I don't think we are moving anywhere. So, so building on what the Vice Chancellor has said, uh, uh, Professor Jalili, what what does this uh, budgetary consideration look like when it comes to capacitating faculty to use some of these online management systems? What do you see in Nigeria? Is that capacity there? Is it sort of a, mix, a mixed picture, as the Vice Chancellor sort of uh, uh, mentioned, how some have been trained and are very good, but others, you know, lack the training or experience in these platforms? What does it look like in, in the Nigerian context? And do you agree with the Vice Chancellor that there needs to be specific and dedicated resources within universities and partnerships formed to, to deal with some of those capacity gaps that are present? Uh, I mean, thank you so much. Uh, the, the budget problem has always been there in Africa. Budgetary allocation to university has always been, a, you know, a very big issue. Uh, most of the universities in Africa are grossly underfunded by different African governments, and that is why there has always been this uh, recurring advocacy that uh, education deserves to be given uh, broader attention. Uh, by the government, both in terms of uh, budgetary allocation and uh, in uh, other areas. Uh, the budgetary allocation issue is one of the reasons uh, why African universities have mostly not been performing optimally. Uh, uh, the budgetary allocation is affecting many things, the capacity to leverage technology to improve the delivery of education to their students, and uh, the capacity of the university to even fund the research by faculty members. Up until now, many faculty members in African universities, they fund their own researches. When they need to publish, when they need to attend conferences, a good number of them, they spend out of their pocket to make this happen. And uh, all of these things they have to take out of their salary for them to do this responsibility. So the budgetary constraint has always been there. But the question is this, is it possible for us to still get certain things off 
this part having this budgetary constraint as an issue to deal with? My answer is yes. For example, Moodle is an open access software that requires minimum, minimum investment for universities in Africa to go to leverage learning my system to improve the delivery of education to their students. I mean, it doesn't require close to $10,000 for us to work with the Gati University to build that capacity to establish the learning management system that is based on mobile for them. We can easily do this. If it's somebody like me, somebody like Peter, somebody like other faculty members who have the capacity and the capability, all they just need to do is to pay our flight ticket we go down there and help them to build that capacity, you know. And when we talk about this capacity, we set it up for them. And the majority of this university, they have IT units. We train the IT unit on how they can maintain, you know, some of these facilities and, uh, you know, upgrade it and attend to some of the problems that might arise from time to time. So the capacity problem, I don't think it requires a lot of money, as I did by the Vice Chancellor. But I think it's about more information, possibly maybe our colleagues over there in Africa, they need more information about uh, some of these uh, uh, zero-cost uh, uh, technological applications that they can actually use to address some of these problems and issues that we are speaking to. Moodle is free for the most part. It's not just about Moodle. There are other things that even they can work with their students to develop a learning management system. Uh, most of the undergraduate students in Africa, they do what they call projects. Sometimes some universities, they call it thesis. Uh, and they have computer science department. Professors can work with their students in computer science department to develop some of this hub. And the university can build on that to improve their educational delivery. But even if they don't want to go that route, the route of all these available you know, uh, softwares technology that they, can, uh, that they can use, that they can leverage to address related problems again. Um, Moodle is just one example. We, can, we don't even have to travel down to that university. Mm -hmm. We don't have to travel down to the University of Lagos to assist the University of Lagos to set, to set up a module-based learning management system. We can organize webinar trainings for them. We can take the IT department through the process of establishing one. And before you know it, a Gatlin University will be approaching a module based learning management system that will increase the effectiveness of the delivery of their courses and other things that are related to the educational processes over there. And the same thing applies to different universities in Africa. Mm -hmm. So that aspect of information, I think, is a critical capital so, that can so, help offset the financial issue that some of these universities might be facing. And that goes back to the issue of collaboration. So looking prof for uh, So, Professor, I, I, I want to just uh, interject there, because one of the things that this raises in my mind is um, we've been talking about resources and you've suggested, Professor, that a lot more can be done with very little. It sounds like that's sort of your approach or what yeah, you're thinking. That is, is, that is the argument. Starting Peter. with IT Peter, that departments. Is the yes, starting with IT department, sending off a few of your faculty members to be trained and then having that cascade throughout the faculty. I, I'm mm -hmm. wondering to you, Vice Chancellor, whether um, when we talk about this training, when we talk about this capacity building there, whether the capacity building looks very different, similar or different across different types of, of colleges and universities. When I, when I mention that, I'm talking a, a lot to do with the, the differences between public schools and private schools. Um, does that capacity building look very differently at, say, a private school than a public school? What are some of the resources that are present in some of these uh, different settings that may not be present in others? I'm curious, uh, Rose, what you, what you have found, Vice Chancellor. Well, um, Ejetron is a public university, and um, we draw our resources mainly from the government, a little from uh, our own uh, internally generated uh, uh, resources. 
If you go for faculties, you will find some faculties are, you know, the faculties are much better off than others. If you use a computer science uh, department, it would be very different from the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences because they have all the computers there. And their priority would be to take care of their own uh, faculty first before they, 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 they pull in other faculty members. So the, the, the disparities are there. Mm -hmm whether we want it or not. Uh, we have, I know each, each uh, department has their own, uh, their own computers and the rest, but it, it, it's never the same. Because if we take, uh, I am still using the, the Department of Computer Science, that is part of their, part of their activity is on the computers. And the other faculties, computer is just uh, being used to help them uh, accelerate their learning. It is not part of them. So when we are giving a budget, we want to give the same budget for computer science uh, as the one we are giving to the faculty of education. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It, it makes sense. <laughs> So, so it, it sounds. Be different. So it sounds like Vice Chancellor that you're you're suggesting, and I think this is an important point that there aren't just disparities between different universities, but there are disparities within universities themselves, right, across different departments yes. and having the the tools there. I think this is a, a really important point. Uh, and and Professor Jalili, do you want to reflect on that? Is that the same case at, at institutions that you work with, like University of Lagos, where it's not just a public versus private or different tiers of universities in the country, but also disparities within universities themselves? Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, I think uh, the same situation applies in the uh, in Nigerian universities. You know, the budgetary allocations uh, to departments in the universities are not necessarily the same. Uh, because uh, the, uh, for example, the logistics needs of a different university, of different departments in the university, uh, might not necessarily be the same. The equipment need might not necessarily be the same. And uh, even the staff, may, you know, the, the, the staff ratio uh, might not necessarily be the same. You know, maybe in certain departments, uh, maybe they have like uh, 300 faculty members and uh, compared to other departments, maybe where they have like 100 faculty members. They don't expect the budgetary allocation to be the same. But yeah, there are creative ways departments can always uh, uh, improve their funding situation. One of the ways a department can improve their funding situation is by establishing collaborations with the industry. And as you know, Pura, most of the United universities in the United States, they don't just rely on budgetary allocation from the university to get support. Nobody does this per se. You know, we have enough collaborations with our stakeholders in the industry, with foundations that bring their money for us to do research. Uh, and I think that this is one area that uh, African University needs to do more. There has been significant improvement over the years. For example, in the University of Lagos, uh, the, the, part, the Faculty of Engineering, when I was there, because for my first year, I was an engineering student, and uh, the guest that was meant to feature from the University of Lagos was, in fact, the dean of the department was the Vice Chancellor when I was a student in the university, and uh, at the point in time, it was the dean of, uh, uh, of the engineering department of the Faculty of Engineering. And one of the things he did during his days as the dean of the Faculty of Engineering was to establish a relationship with the industry. Engineering and manufacturing industry, they came to the university, some of them committed to donating equipment, some of them they committed to donating classrooms and uh, they committed to doing all sorts of things. So these are some of the ways that our departments can actually leverage uh, the, the, gown, the town to, you know, to improve their funding conditions. And there are other ways too. We graduate students every other year Many of our students from different departments across different universities in Africa, they are CEOs of countries. Many of our students are ministers and commissioners. Many of our students, they are doing great, you know, contributing within and outside of the country enormously. 
to the development of their community, to the development of their country, and to the development of our world as a whole. Mm -hmm. We can tap into this enormous alumni resources to actually drive our different departments. And that is why it's also important that the funding plan of different departments should incorporate all of their former students who have graduated and they are doing great. There are ways we should introduce this concept of give back, you know, tracking them when they leave the university, keeping contact with them and trying to get their involvement, get them involved in our world's affairs, you know. University can't just be alone in isolation of all of the students that have gone through there. You know, majority of the things that are done in the universities in the United States, you know, there is this input of our students, as students, you know, they bring them money, they are creating endowment, you know, they are establishing scholarship. So we need to do more of all these kinds of things in, our, in different African universities. In that way, we can create a funding pool that complement to a greater extent the little amount that we are getting from government in funding our university. The other thing is this, Africa University, they have to take advantage of something. Their political power base, I call it the political capital. For every election that is conducted in Africa, a huge proportion of the voting populations are the students. Meaning that if the students and the universities make budgetary allocation and issue on the ballot, an issue that determines who gets voted in and who gets voted out, we might be able to change some of these narratives that are related to the funding of education in Africa. Because one thing with the politician is this, if you ask a politician to pick between dying and losing an election, it is more likely that a politician would prefer losing, not losing an election to dying. Because the real death to a politician is not when the person dies and gets buried. They know everybody is going to die one day. The real death to a politician is when they stand and lose election or when they lose being re-elected into offices. That is life to politician. And when you understand this, and you understand that it's almost impossible for them to get re-elected or elected without the numbers. And you further realize that you are in control of a huge political capital, student population, you know, faculty population, and even you are not just controlling the student if we do our job well. We can also exert some leverages on the parent and the relative of a student because through our influence on a student, they can influence their relative by saying, you got for this, you got to for this. Because this person has made the funding of education a priority issue when he or she gets elected into offices. So we also need to look at the political angle of how we can actually change the landscape of funding. I mean, this is a very radical thought. I understand this, and I understand the traditionalism. But it, but it, when it comes to the, but it, it sounds like but but it sounds like um, you're suggesting that there needs to be more mobilization, societal mobilization. No, 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 that's the point, Peter. Mo mobilization in support of priorities that will then be reflected in some of the major platforms of political uh, political actors, political parties, and, and, and politicians, and the government overall. It seems like that's very important in solving this equation in your view, Professor. I mean, that's, that's the point, Peter. Yeah, that is the point, and I'm very, very emphatic with this. Uh, for many reasons. One, uh, you know, I've been on the other side of the spectrum as a student leader. I've been on the, on the side of the spectrum, you know, as a student in, in African universities. And uh, I've, as I mentioned at the beginning of this interview, I've met no less than 1,000 students from different countries and different universities in Africa. And one of the issues that all of them, a common denominator in all the conversation I had with these more than 1,000 students was the issue of funding. And now I interact more with faculty members across different universities in Africa. We have very brilliant professors in African universities, but they struggle with funding. Look at the issue of COVID-19. African universities were not really on top of the matter. Why? Because there is not enough funding coming for them to do their research before COVID-19. 
So how do you inform, how do you expect their research to inform policy responses to the issue of COVID-19 on the continent? In other places in the world, we heard about university professors running models, dictating policy direction, telling politicians, if you go this way, you're going to plug the country into crisis. Even when governments want to, when they come up with policies, as you know, in North America and in other parts of the world, you only set scientific evidence. Scientists said this, scientists said this, based on the best knowledge that is available. We are making this decision, we are making that decision. We are going to go this way in terms of policy direction. And it's all about scientists. It's all about I, academics. I, I, professor, I want, I want to turn to the, the vice chancellor on this point. Um, in terms of advocacy, as well as getting governmental and, and broader policy and resource support. What in Kenya and, and from your experience as being a vice chancellor, what does that advocacy look like when it comes to advocating for resources um, from governmental institutions? Um, how effect, what, what works in, in obtaining those resources? Or are there a lot of barriers to um, bringing higher education to become a, a really big priority on behalf of, of those in government? Well, it's difficult to say, but uh, what I want to... Advocacy is good, according to my friends. But I don't know that it is going to uh, bring any impact in the university. If you are working with the government, uh, we are a public university. Mm -hmm. um, there are times when we have to talk to the politicians to help us uh, get our, our budget right, but it doesn't work much for us. Um, we may have to look for funding outside. We can't rely on uh, what we get from the government only. If we have to um, have improvement within our universities, we have to get some funding internationally by writing proposals or uh, working with other universities so that we can share some of the resources to be able to make our ends meet. But relying only on government uh, funding, I find it uh, not very, it, it doesn't reach where I want it to reach. There's something missing. Yeah, it, it sounds We have like... to do other things. I am not sure about Nigeria, but uh, for Kenya, for us to do research, we normally have to do some, uh, do our own proposals and get funding from elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, if you depend on the government uh, money for research, for example, you will not do research. So we have a lot to do. I don't know whether any lobbying will help. Mm -hmm. Maybe let's start with Nigeria. It might help us. I don't know. We yes. may borrow from you. So, <laughs> and, that, and that's wonderful because I, I think one of the key things on this program we want is to, to share those diverse experiences because some of the, the strategies and approaches that may work in one context may translate to another or may not, right? There are, there are different and nuanced challenges that are, are, are present there. And I, I just wanted to, to follow up, uh, Vice Chancellor, on your, your comment about how the government basically suggest, you know, d is not maybe as willing and forthcoming with some resources, so the university has to seek resources from outside internationally and from other grants that are present or through partnerships. And I'm curious, does the government, in a sense, know that that's what you're going to do? In other words, do they say, well, we don't have to fund um, the, the amount of resources maybe we should because we expect you to go outside to get that money? In other words, it's, it's somehow uh, another one's responsibility. And so when they realize that you're beginning at Edgerton to get those relationships, to get those grants, they look at your bottom line and they say, well, I guess you don't need any of our support or you don't need so much support. Is, do you think that that functions in a, as well as they sort of um, it's, it's sort of a, a, a circle here, uh, a cycle where they say, well, we're not going to fund you because you're getting from outside. And then the university says, well, we're not going to, you know, we're not getting resources, so we have to go outside. Is, is that how it functions or is there something else at, at, at play there, Vice Chancellor?
Hello, Peter. Looks like the connection is a, a little bit frozen there. Um, so, uh, Professor Jalil, you want to address that issue? Um, it seems like there may be some sort of uh, a vicious cycle, in a sense, where um, universities um, are, you know, governments are anticipating that universities are going to get finances outside, so they say, well, we don't have to finance so much internally. Do you think that takes place in Nigeria? What is, what is that kind of equation in, in your reflection on what the Vice Chancellor has just suggested? I mean, you know, the Vice Chancellor is speaking from uh, an administrative perspective. Uh, I mean, she's on the off seat, and uh, I mean, she's speaking from experience. I mean, she's been trying to get money to fund our university and uh, to making sure that uh, all the financial responsibility are uh, adequately taken care of. And uh, she was honest enough to speak to the encouragers the they have, uh, you know, in terms of uh, getting politicians to give the deserved attention that uh, financial attention that a uh, university uh, education uh, actually deserves over the in Kenya. And I think the same situation applies uh, in, uh, in uh, most African universities, particularly those in Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, as a result, government told them, I was aware of uh, conversations when I was a student that uh, got to the level of faculty members telling me that government will tell them, go sort it yourself outside. You know, go look for this money outside. And, and you know how this works. Once government knows that uh, money is coming to the university in Africa from outside, they tend to give attention to other things. You know, that is the flip side of it. You know, they believe that the issue is already being attended to. And it's not just in the educational sector in Africa. Uh, when you look at the activities of NGO, uh, you know, some NGOs have really been doing well in Africa, you know, plugging the gaps in areas where government is not, the government in Africa are not doing what they should be doing. And in those areas that NGOs are trying to plug the gaps, what I've observed speaking with a lot of guys who are coordinating NGOs is that government tends to reduce attention in that area because they believe the issue is already receiving some level of attention. So, uh, and that is why we need to get into the awakening, to the consciousness of politicians that even if universities are doing better, mobilizing funds and resources from private sector, uh, governments still need to do their part. For many reasons, Peter, as you know, as a faculty member, when we get funding from outside, it doesn't mean that the funding might not have some influences on what we do, on what we do in the university. For example, let's assume that uh, uh, a big complaint that is into you know the production of uh, improved seats has opted to maybe support the university with uh, three million dollars, and uh, and part of this thing is that the funding is actually going to the agricultural department. You know, in that same department. It may be difficult for people that are doing things that are, you know, contrary to the interest uh, of uh, that particular funding, uh, you know, uh, uh, funding company. You know, it will be so difficult for some people to be doing the research that to be, you know, talking in the opposite direction of the interest of that particular company. It might just be that they will withdraw their funding in the long run, maybe after some years. Uh, because you might feel that uh, you're actually working at cost purposes uh, in relation to their interests. And that is why the government itself, which is the one that actually, you know, uh, actually advocates and standing for the overall public interest, need to be committed to funding our educational institution. Because the government won't be doing this because they have any other interest other than the public interest. The government will be doing that solely for public interest. But when you bring some of this funding against you, you rely on them to fund your universities alone, to fund most of the activities of your university. Then you also have to be reminded that uh, there's no Father Christmas per se anyway. You know, if you do things that they are not comfortable with, it's very possible that they will withdraw their funding. If you do things that will get them out of their businesses, it's very possible that they will reduce their funding support mm -hmm. because they have to survive in their own various businesses as well. They have to make sure that you are, you know, you are making them to be losers in their own businesses as well. And that is why the government needs to be made to do the right thing. If the government is not doing the right thing, the alternative is not to look for something else to replace the government. 
I think part of the solution is to figure out how to make the government to do the right thing. And part of doing the right thing is to figure out how we can get increased attention from government in Africa in, in regards to the funding of, uh, of education at all levels, not just at the university level, including at the tertiary and, and uh, you know, IIS and, uh, and the college education level. All of these things need to receive increased uh, funding attention. But that said, University, they need to do better forming this collaboration through which you can get some funding and then address some of the problems that are facing uh, uh, higher education delivery in the various African universities. So uh, we're up against time and we're going to close in just a few minutes. Um, but I think Rose's connection is, is working now. The vice chancellor's connection hopefully is working. Um, and, and I have a question to you, uh, Vice Chancellor, sort of our, our last question. We talked about advocacy um, with governments um, and for funding. Um, you know, how much is the government going to be a part of solving some of these challenges in terms of you, the use of technology, creating budgets, in, in, include, you know, infusing the resources that are necessary? So how much should one be putting an emphasis on advocacy work and changing the mindsets of those who are in, in political power to change this equation that we looked at. I was talking about the government earlier. It, uh, my, my, my side of the, uh, of the presentation went off. But what I need to tell you is that the government is willing, is willing to give, but it, it is, will never be enough. You get my point. And that's why we always to other to our researchers, the collaboration able to attain what we want. It's not that the government is either not giving even if we need to work on it and also find out how we can uh, let the government have more emphasis on uh, higher education. Mm -hmm. You know, right now, for us, we put more emphasis on uh, primary education because we want many people to be literate and all that. So uh, out in the universities, we now need to think of how do we make the universities also be part center of the, of the government initiative, which they are doing, but you see, need more it is that is uh, killing us we have to look for it from outside somewhere mm -hmm. so professor Jimmy, i don't think advocacies will help much right now mm -hmm. so professor julie what do you think about the the hope uh, and the potential yes. for advocacy um are you as a uh, sort of pessimistic or skeptical of some of those efforts at least at this given time as uh, the vice chancellor is and what is the I mean, I think, like in Nigeria? I mean, a dose of everything is required. I mean, uh, that uh, education is getting increased attention in terms of funding uh, from uh, different African countries is because of the advocacy that uh, African government uh, they need to fund, uh, commit up to 15% of their budgetary allocation to funding education. You know, it's not just about uh, Africans themselves calling to this. A lot of international organizations, uh, you know, a lot of uh, collaborating, you know, friends of different African countries, a lot of funding agencies, they've always been seeing this with different governments in Africa. And that possibly explains why some African countries have been experiencing, you know, remarkable increase in the, the budgetary allocation to funding education. So I won't think uh, that, I think it's a bit of everything. We need uh, the advocacy on this issue to be sustained, to be increased. And uh, we also need the aspect of uh, lobbying the politician. I think it's a dose of everything. We need the aspect of advocacy. You know, sometimes when you don't put money on politicians, 
they don't get the job done. They don't even see the urgency in the issue you are pressing for. You know, because uh, the issue with advocacy is that uh, it not it does not only bring the issues, you know, to their reckoning as a powerful issue. It also comes with prayer that reminds them that if this thing does not receive the desired attention, it might be the very limits for which they will lose election. And as I told you, politicians losing election to them is like a death sentence. They don't want to die by losing election. You know, they just want to die the natural death. They're not really afraid of time. But the real dead politicians are afraid of this losing election. They are afraid of that death. So, and I believe that uh, advocacy is one of the ways we can actually get them on their toes uh, so that they can increase their budget, the budgetary allocation to education. And the good thing about advocacy is that if you also support what Professor always suggested, the issue of lobbying them, you know, the issue of, uh, you know, having this conversation with them, this gentleman conversation. Advocacy will back that up with the required prayer for them to do the needful. But when the required prayer is just there, we are just having this gentleman conversation, or oh, uh, your excellency, you know, legislator, uh, Mr. Senator, you know, Mr. Honorable, whatever you want to call them. You know, it will just start and end there. And the other thing is that there are other sectors that are also competing for funding attention. If those sectors are leveraging advocacy, and those of us in the educational sector, we are not leveraging advocacy, it might mean that uh, those sectors should be receiving greater attention at the expense of uh, committing greater uh, you know, uh, 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 resources to funding our educational sector. And we need to do this advocacy in a way that is not going to compromise you know, the, the peace of a particular country or the peace in a particular society or what have you, we need to do it creatively uh, in a way that we we'll get our goals achieved and uh, uh, without causing anarchy in the system. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Professor. I want to thank both of you for coming on today. And I know we face some technical issues starting off a bit later than we usually do. Um, and uh, this is the nature of doing our, our communications across different continents, different places. But these conversations surrounding the issues of resources, higher education, advocacy, um, and this advent of, of these discussions around e-learning are really important. And although they are being raised more and more in this period of COVID-19, they will be important conversations to continue as we, as we move forward uh, today as co collaborators, uh, as well as uh, vice chancellor, and uh, as well as professors and faculty members as well. So I want to thank you, Vice Chancellor Rose Mwanya, uh, for joining us today from Kenya. Thank you so much. And I want to thank you thank as you, well. Thank you, Peter. And I want to thank you, Professor Jalili Adabi, for joining us as well from Michigan State University. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Peter, for having us today. And uh, thank you, Professor Rosa, uh, for all your beautiful comments. Uh, I really enjoyed listening to you. Wonderful. So that brings us to the end of our edition of Leaders of Africa Live today. I'm glad that you can join us. As you saw, we had some technical difficulties. That happens when we are trying to communicate across many different countries to ensure that there is a broad uh, amount of perspectives on our program. We encourage you to join us on our next Leaders of Africa Live program. You may subscribe on our website. If you go to our website, leadersofafrica.org, that's the collaborative's website, you're able to subscribe to our newsletters, and that is where you get information as to when our next uh, broadcast will be. You can also subscribe to us on YouTube as well. It will also push alerts for when our next Leaders of Africa Live event will be. And so we've had a great conversation. There have been a many issues that have been raised, issues of inequities within universities, issues of, of advocacy, issues of resources, all very important topics that will be continually topics of conversation as we move forward during this COVID-19 area and beyond. So we ask you to continue the conversation on this platform and all of Leaders of Africa platforms. And that's all for me, Peter Panar, on this edition of Leaders of Africa Live. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Bye.